Good old song, too. And it's good to be here. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. You better wait before you put your tomato plants out. That's all I can say. i got time. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Turn to 1 Corinthians 5 with me tonight. I don't know about you, but one of the best things in this world is a fresh, homegrown tomato. Homegrown. Nothing like it. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse number 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And you're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one into Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord, Jesus. Now that is a very, very uh, controversial scripture. How do you do that? Think about that. Verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Now watch what he does here. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And Father, I pray now, Lord, that bless your word as it goes forth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, the Apostle Paul takes this case of this man here. And this, you know, if you, if you know anything about your Bible, read it at all, this jumps right off the pages of the Scripture. Here's a man in the church house. And it's about as dastardly a deed as you'll find. It's a, it's a reprehensible thing. It's a filthy thing, a vile thing. Yet down through the years, I, that, uh, I have seen things happen in the church house that will blow your mind. It's unbelievable sometimes that some of the things that go on. But in any event, the apostle says that you're puffed up, you're proud, you're arrogant. And you should have judged this man, but you didn't do it. And you used him as a kind of a springboard for your own self-righteousness. That's what it amounts to. In other words, it made you feel good because you're not doing what he's doing. And so you feel good about it. And the Bible says that when you compare yourself with yourself, you're not wise. Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 10. That's not a good thing. Comparing themselves with themselves, they're not wise. The fact of the matter is, the less you look at people and more you look at God, the better off you'll be. You need to get your eyes off of people and off of each other and off yourself. But the Apostle Paul takes this case right here. And he compares it with something. Look at verse number 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? In plain words, you can't have a, a little island of a problem here. The very nature of a sheepfold is that it will spread and it will affect the whole flock. And that's just the nature of sheep. So that's just the way it is. And he said that his uh, sheep know him. And he has other sheep that are not of this uh, fold. Verse 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you're unleavened. All right? Clean this out. The old leaven. This is the old leaven. The man that has his father's wife. This is old leaven, you see. It's up to the Christian to cleanse that, to purge that. Now notice carefully what he does. He uses an illustration here. It's very important that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Now he's talking to Corinthians. <laughs> These Corinthians are as Gentile as it gets. These are not Jewish Christians. These are Gentiles. And he, but he's using the illustration of the Jewish Passover. Now, the Passover, of course, as you were well familiar, was what God used to deliver them from Egyptian bondage. 
They'd been there 400 years. It took the blood of a lamb over the doorpost and lintel to keep the death angel from entering into that home. He could not cross the blood. And he neither can he cross it today. And there's one thing that the spirit world knows the power of, and that's the blood of Christ. Most of the church doesn't know it, but the spirit world does. The demons know it. The blood of Christ is an almighty, all-powerful agent against wickedness. But in verse number 7, he said, For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. The Apostle Paul is using Passover here in a spiritual sense. He's taking a lesson from it. He's trying to say that we're not keeping the Passover, the Jewish Passover, year in and year out like the Jews do. And there certainly was nothing wrong with them keeping it. That's exactly what they should have done. Although, when you go back and you look at the history of Israel, they went for a long time and didn't keep the Passover. And the Passover is a very important thing because it was reminding them of where they came from, how they got out of it, and where they're headed. But the Lord Jesus took the Jewish Passover and He turned it into what we call the Lord's Supper. He gathered them together and He said, Now this is the New Testament in my blood. And then He took the blood and He took the bread and He taught them the great lesson of how the bread's His body and the blood is His blood. And that this is the New Testament, the New Covenant. You have an Old Covenant and a New Covenant. The Old Covenant was the covenant that He, in, com in contrast to it, the covenant of Sinai. It's not the covenant that God made with Abraham. That was, a, that was a unconditional covenant, and the sign of it was circumcision. And God blessed Abraham and set him aside to bless all nations. But the covenant that he contrasted the Passover with is not the covenant that uh, he gave Abraham, but it was the covenant of Moses, the Mosaic covenant, the covenant of the law. And he said, this is the blood of the New Testament, this blood, this cup, the new covenant, hakene diatheke. And I've told you before, when you get into the book of Hebrews, the translators of Hebrews takes the he diatheke and they translate it testament. Then they translate it covenant. If you'll look in Hebrews chapter number 8, the word is translated covenant as it relates to Israel and it's translated testament as it relates to you Gentiles and me. Now, these were all millennial baby sprinklers. These, 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 these men, they're Christians. They love the Lord under King James. They, Lancelot Andrews was a brilliant man. They set them aside in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in groups of 50. And they translated the Bible. They love the Lord, but they are amillennial. And they're also baby sprinklers. But when they got to the book of Hebrews, for some strange reason, it's almost like God intervened. They were not consistent in translating diatheke. If they had been consistent, it would be testament all the way through, or it would be covenant all the way through. See what I mean? But in some places it's covenant, and in some places it's testament. The testament applies to we Gentiles, the covenant to Israel. And when you go home tonight or sometime this week, take, take uh, Hebrews 8 and read it, and you'll see that's clearly a reference to Israel, when he shall take away their sins and put a new heart in them, and he calls it a covenant. Now we're coming in the periods called Easter. And right now we're in this 40-day period of time between Ash Wednesday and Easter. Now we don't say much about that in the Baptist church. Rightfully so. It's not necessary. But it's called Lent. This 40 days between Ash Wednesday and Easter is called Lent. Well, what is Lent? It's a period of self-introspection, repentance, uh, Denying themselves certain things, fasting in some sense in certain ways, for 40 days, as being 40 days, as being a time of testing in the Bible, that's universally accepted. There's no argument in that among Christians that the number 40 is a period of testing, trial, 40 years in the wilderness. So 40 days and 40 nights it rains, so forth. But it starts, and this is what's important tonight. Because the way this thing comes about, and what you have in your Bible right here is quite remarkable. An epiphany. One of the epiphanies is when the angel announced the birth of Christ, and the wise men showed up from the east, and God was manifested in the flesh. In other words, it was a giving forth of a light. It was a giving forth of a manifestation. Well, there is an epiphany associated with the birth of Christ around December the 25th. This epiphany has to do with 
uh, religious, uh, sets in motion religious events. Let's put it that way. And right before Ash Wednesday is Fat Tuesday. Anyone's ever heard of Fat Tuesday? But there's another name for it. Mardi Gras. All right? Mardi Gras. You say, well, I, f I just thought that was a bunch of drunken debauchery down there in, in New Orleans. Well, it's not only in New Orleans. Knoxville is on the map now. And there's a, there's a, there's a crowd of religious people that have drug it into this town. It's also in Mobile, Alabama, and it's in a lot of other places in the country. Mardi Gras is a abomination. That's the best way I know to put it. It is a filthy, vile display of flesh. Not only a display of flesh, but a, a reveling in flesh. It is some of the worst abominable practices in this country. Uh, you run a little history back on it. They say in 1699, Frenchmen came over here from France, commissioned to uh, uh, do some survey work and this and that and so forth. And Frenchmen uh, started right down below New Orleans. They built a campfire and they had, a, they, had their, they had their little Mardi Gras. And it grew from there. Well, it's not important. But the bottom line is that Mardi Gras is part of a religious ceremony that's what's important did you know that did you know that epiphany leads into fat tuesday which leads into ash wednesday which leads into 40 days of lent which leads into easter did you know that did you know that mardi gras is religious from the top of its head to the bottom of its feet it is religious to the bone and being religious, therefore, gives it a certain amount of credibility with some people. In other words, they say to themselves, well, I'm a Christian. Maybe I need to, be do, this. Maybe I need to do this because this will help me in my, in my relationship with God. A lot of people call themselves Christians that don't know Christ. There's a lot of cultural Christianity around. They're born into a certain church, sprinkled when they're babies, confirmed at a certain age, on it goes. And then they call themselves Christians. The idea that you can go to a place, to a hell hole like New Orleans. I've been there one time. I lasted about 30 minutes. I said to my wife, I'm out of here. And there wasn't anything going on. We didn't go to, we just, we were headed to a certain area and I thought, well, we're this close. So we dropped into New Orleans just to see what it looked like and parked our car. And the moment I got out of that car, I felt the spirit in that hell hole and I was gone in 30 minutes. And we hardly saw a soul. So I did not go to the Mardi Gras. Believe me, didn't go to anything down there. But I was gone. I was away from there. Now I know we've probably got some believers that live in that area. And I don't want to offend you just because for offense sake... But there's a spirit in that place. There is a spirit down there. And the idea that you can go down there and indulge in the flesh so that the next day you can have somebody put ashes on your forehead and then you're repentant for the next 40 days, that's religion. That's not saying that all people that have ashes on their forehead are not Christians. I'm sure there's a lot of people out here in the Lutheran church and so forth who have ashes on their forehead on Ash Wednesday who don't go to Mardi Gras, who don't partake of that hell hole. Are you following me tonight? No doubt. And that's part of their tradition. All right. I'm not condemning somebody for having something like that on their forehead. Not at all. Uh, not at all. But I am trying to make a point. And that point is this. There were people running around with ashes on their forehead that just a few days before were engaged in orgies and every kind of godless debauchery on the face of this earth. Right? You better believe it. And next year they'll do the same thing again. Well, they're repenting for the next 40 days. All right, here's the problem. Okay? Here's the problem. Once you're born of the Spirit of the living God, you don't want to do that. Okay? You change. 
Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. Uh, 5, rather, and verse number 8. Let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must you needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner with such an one, know not to eat. For what, I, what, for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? In other words, he said, that's not my responsibility to judge those that are without. Do not you judge them that are within? But them that are without, God will judge them. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. You see, this is the mechanics of it. This is what he's telling them that they need to do. But the Apostle Paul is saying in his soul, I shouldn't have to tell you that. That's the problem. He said, I, I should not have to tell you. He said, I wanted to come to you as unto mature, but I couldn't do it. I had to come to you as in babes. Because carnality will never let you grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord. Just because you fill your head full of a bunch of facts, that's not spiritual growth. Spiritual growth can only come with victories. The Holy Spirit builds within you victory after victory after victory. And in every victory that God gives you, you learn a little more about yourself and you learn a little more about the devil. These are victories that must be fought. Yes, victories. These are battles that must be fought to win the victory. And thanks be unto God for the victory. Amen. You know, <clears throat> there's an awful lot of preaching that, uh, whether they realize it or not, is, uh, is really making manifest <laughs> the people they're preaching to. You know, if you're, if you're preaching on certain things, it's obvious that there seems to be a problem with those certain things, right? The church at Corinth was one of the most carnal bunch on the face of the earth. Did you know that? Carnal as they could be. This is a carnal crowd. Now, what's, what's the consummation of epiphany? Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras, Ash Wednesday, Lent, and then Easter. Easter. Now, if you go run a little survey on this, do, do a little Googling on this on the Internet, it won't take you long to find out this. Mardi Gras is linked to the Roman celebration, Lupercalia. An Internet search quickly ties the god Lupercus back to Tammuz and eventually Nimrod. In discussing false worship, the Bible calls the sight of women weeping for Tammuz an abomination. Take note of what the Bible says about Tammuz. You know, it's quite a thing when you realize the roots of something, the foundation of it, what it leads back to, where it started. Now, we know all sin is connected with Satan, don't we? But sometimes it's, it's very enlightening to see just exactly where it will take you back to. That's quite a remarkable thing. I did a little reading this afternoon about Mardi Gras. They have what's called crews, K-R-E-W-E, -E, crew. And each one of the crew is a kind of like a club. And each club presents its own part in this parade. Now, probably the worst of all is the one in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. That's, I mean, that thing down there. And a lot of it has to do probably with the fact that it is Brazil and not the United States. But the United States is quickly catching up. But that is one of the most abominable things that you could ever imagine in your life in Rio, in Rio the, the, uh, the thing connected with uh, Lent and Mardi Gras and Ash Wednesday and Shrove Tuesday and all the rest of it. But you know what? 
1973, when I got saved, my life changed. I had a desire for spiritual things. I had a desire for the things of God. I had a desire for God Himself. I really did. And you know what? It grieves my heart when I see people who are dedicated to their church, yet their religion hadn't done one thing to change their life. Hadn't done one thing. They're, they're still the same old person they were before. Now what is Easter? What are we leading up to Easter now? Easter is the New Testament Passover, right? Did he not take them into the upper room? And he took the Passover lamb. He took the Passover feast. He took the message of the Passover. He took all of that. And then he took that and he, twi- he, he, he turned it into and taught them the application of how I am that Passover lamb. See, I am. Because they had to keep it up 14 days. To make sure it had no blemishes. Well Christ is the Passover lamb. His blood is the Passover blood. So what did they do with the blood? The Passover blood. What did they do with it in the Old Testament? They put it over the doorpost and little. They applied it. They didn't talk about it. They didn't preach about it. They didn't sing about it. That's all fine. But it had to be applied. Don't we sing when I see the blood? I will pass over you. And see, this is what's happening today. Religion stops short of making the real application of what the blood's about. That's right. What's the blood about? The Bible says we have faith in His blood. Right? The Bible said that we are washed in His blood. The Bible said we have peace with God through His blood. So how do we do it then, preacher? What we have to do is to take the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that he entered into heaven with. And he did. Don't ever let some fellow get up in the pulpit. And I've heard the Baptists do this. And they are as dead wrong as they can possibly be. And they're up there preaching and telling people that no literal blood ever went into heaven. That the blood shed at the cross simply was symbolic of his life that was given. Okay? His life that was given. Folks, the Bible says plainly in the book of Hebrews, He entered in with His blood into the holy place. And He made peace with God through His blood. He carried the blood into that holy place. And that blood was applied to the mercy seat. And that mercy seat is what He sits on. You remember what I told you a few weeks back? You can't see the law. You can't see the tables of stone. You can't see Aaron's rod that budded without him standing up. He has to stand up off of the mercy seat and you have to raise the lid to look in and see that. I'd rather he stay seated. (laughs) The reason he's seated is because the work's finished. And everything that the law demanded, everything that that rod represented, and everything that that manna was for, is all fulfilled in the one seated on that seat. Now, where did the blood, when that priest, high priest, went into the holy place on the seventh month, the tenth day of the month, where was the blood applied? The mercy seat. The mercy seat. And he was in total darkness. The only light that was inside that holy place, the holy of holies, not the holy, but the holy of holies behind the curtain, the only light in there had to be the glory of God. The only other, he could not take any kind of artificial light. He couldn't even wear shoes. And so therefore, when he was applying that blood, he had to be he had to have full faith unless the glory was there he had to have faith that that blood was going onto that mercy seat and that blood was applied down on that mercy seat and there is where the son of god sat down at the right hand of the father on that seal of the blood on the mercy seat and so 
The Lord Jesus Christ has sealed his testimony, sealed our salvation, and sealed his witness with his blood. Now, do you believe in the blood? Which one do you believe in, the church or the blood? What about the catechism of the blood? What about the preacher of the blood? Nothing can take the place of the blood. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And when you believe in the blood, then you have to say to yourself, whose blood is that? It's the blood of the Lamb of God. It is the blood of a sinless substitute who died in your place. It is the blood of one who gave his life so that you could be cleansed by his blood from your sins. That's what you're putting faith in. Right? If you put faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the blood that was shed at the cross at Calvary, that's saving faith. That's saving faith. And that's what will save your soul. So these people that are in their religion, they start their religion with an epiphany. Then their religion takes them into Mardi Gras. Then their religion will take them to Ash Wednesday. Then their religion will take them to 40 days of Lent. Then their religion will consummate in their Easter. And through all of their religious uh, practices and all of their religious holidays and all of their religious festivals, it will do them no good whatsoever. Not one bit. Not one bit. Not one bit. It is useless, a waste, and nothing but a bunch of religious garbage. The only thing that matters is the blood of Christ. And if you've been washed in the blood this Easter... It'll mean something to you because he rose from the dead, never to die again. Amen. And you know, all these years since I got saved in 1973, uh, I didn't know much about Lent. I saw a sign one time that said Shrove Tuesday, and I thought, what is that? Or there's a Monday, Thursday, Monday, M A U N D Y. And they put all this stuff up on the board up there, and I think, now what is all this stuff? Lent, you know, and all this stuff. Because I got saved in 1973, and I didn't know anything about Lent. Or any of the rest of it. It's just a bunch of religious formality that will get you nothing. The only thing that will matter when it comes time to stand before God, has the blood been applied. Amen. And I hope you, I hope you understood what I said. There's a lot of people involved in this stuff, and every year they go through these rituals, and a lot of these people, no doubt, are genuine Christians, and they love the Lord. And it's part of their cultural tradition, no doubt. But for you and for me to know what we know, do you think you could go into that and be part of it? Well, of course not. There's no way in the world you could, because you know better. And there's the difference. That's how God deals with every one of us. You know. Now that you know, then it makes all the difference in the world. Father, I pray that you bless your word, Lord. And bless my brothers and sisters as we study the scripture. In thy name we pray. Amen.